And today I want to give a special video for my LinkedIn viewers to understand portfolio theory. Modern portfolio theory failed a long time ago. Modern portfolio theory is based on bell curve distributions of returns, which doesn't reflect the real world. To understand today's postmodern portfolio theory, you have to understand skewness. And the person who's who writes the best, I think, about skewness is Nassim Taleb. In particular, his book called Anti-Fragile goes into a concept called convexity. And to understand convexity and the power of options, uh, I want to just break down a few concepts from that book because it's actually a very thick book. And most people, it's his, it's his longest book. Most people don't read it. I have all the other books on here. And they're easier to read, but, but Anti-Fragile is an important book. It talks about convexity and building a barbell portfolio. I often talk with people about investments, and they, they tell me about the future. They tell me that they're afraid of a recession, they're battening down the hatches, they're running to safety, they're really concerned about a future recession. It could be worldwide, it could be U.S., China, it could be any number of things. I also heard recently that I think it was Paul Tudor Jones, one of the famous hedge fund investors, saying that, that prices are poised to break out, that there's just a huge bull market just right around the corner on top of the 10-year bull market we're already experiencing. Uh, there are a lot of people who have a position about the future and people who think they know what the central banks will do because the Fed causes most recessions directly in the United States and central banks around the world play the majority role in any long-term recession. They essentially cause them. But we don't know what they'll do. We don't know how they'll react. And so, you know, the crystal ball is great, and if you want to bet your career on it, that's fine. But I believe it makes more sense to say, I don't know. I don't know what the future is. I want to, pre to create a portfolio that will do well regardless of what happens, whether it's high volatility, low volatility, recession now, recession later, black swan events, war, inflation. Uh, these things are impossible to predict. So why not build a portfolio that is agnostic, that doesn't care what happens to the macro econ economy? And that's what I want to talk about here. In portfolio theory, and this is true for companies or even family offices, uh, on the project side as well as, as investment, we have a matrix where we show the, high, the higher the payoff and the higher the effort, the more you may gain from an investment or from a project. And so down here we have low payoff and low effort. And these are the nuts. These are the things that are easy to pick up. Everyone can get them. This would be in, uh, in terms of a financial portfolio, treasury bills, government bonds. Things are easy to get and have fairly low payoff. And then over here are the white elephants, which take a lot of effort and have low yield. And these are very common in any company or uh, in any portfolio, whether it's projects or investments. At least 20% of those are white elephants, where you're just putting too much work into them for just not enough payoff. Things that have low, low effort and high payoff, those are called pearls. Well, you, all you have to do is open an oyster and find a pearl. Unfortunately, it's not that easy because not every oyster has a pearl. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so there's a chance of finding a pearl and you have to quantify that chance. And then we have high effort and high payoff and those are the moonshots. Billionaires like to take moonshots and that's great. They change the world that way. If they don't work out, uh, they're the ones who bear the cost. But if they do work out, everyone benefits. That's pretty cool. In portfolio terms, we want to look at getting pearls. Pearls are, you know, what does it take to get high reward but low effort in our portfolio? To do that, I want to use an example of Apple stock. You may be, you may have seen this graph lately. This is the price of Apple stock over the last 10 years. If you had bought Apple stock 10 years ago, it was selling for about $30, and now it's at $815. And so that would have been tremendous. But not everybody knew that 10 years ago, late 2009. Well, if everybody did know that, then you would have seen the price spike right up. There's no way to tell that ahead of time. Markets are very efficient. What if we, instead of buying the stock, what if we bought an option? Now, what if you had bought, say, a one-year option on Apple stock? You might, you might pay $10 for that option. 
And if the price goes up $10, you've doubled your money. So that's tremendous leverage. On the other hand, if it goes down, you lose your money. And options run out, right? Options have a time limit. The person writing the option said, well, you can have the option for a year, for six months, for three months, for a month, but I'm not going to give it more than that. And at that time, you know, you either exercise it or it just expires worthless. And that's what I'm hoping. The person writing the option hopes that it expires worthless. Now, let me give you the concept of an infinite period option. Suppose that we could establish the price of the option, but it would go forever. It would just last forever. You could just cash it in or not. You, if the price goes down, you could just hang on to the option. And if it ever claws back up and gets back up above where you bought it, uh, you could cash it out. Now, that would be a good option, right? The question is, how much does it cost? And if you look at option prices and you understand the Black-Scholes option pricing theory, the longer out the options, the more expensive they are. The first trillion dollars has already been made on Apple stock. Could Apple stock double or quadruple from here? We don't know. It might. Uh, I'll give you an option. I'll give you an option. It, it would be, it'll be, uh, you can have it forever and the price has to be, you know, more than it is now and you can cash it in. But if Apple stock goes down more than, let's say, 10%, which it has relatively recently, so there's a bit of risk there, you lose it all. Is anybody going to sell you that option? I don't know. But if someone offered you that option, would you buy it? And the answer is yes. You might want to have some, but not that much. Maybe you could do that for the S&P 500 or for 50 different stocks. You might want to load up on some of those options and you, you might want the you might want the floor to be lower. You know, there's a lot of different ways to price that, but it's an infinite option. And infinite options don't exist in the real world, do they? So you never find someone, you can look in the option table, you're never going to find one that's infinite, except that there are. And people who study options generally don't think of this. This is, a, this is kind of a secret in the world of private equity that brand new companies, startups, when you buy the stock of a brand new company that's tremendously uncertain, and most of them go to zero, when you buy the stock of that company, you're essentially, you're effectively buying an option because, the, because of the convexity, because it doesn't cost much. Chances of it paying off are not very high, but it's forever. The stock, you hold that stock forever. So if you think about the economics of a venture capital firm, They'll buy 30 to 40, sometimes 50 stocks uh, of brand new companies. They know that 80% of them will go away. They know that 10%, 15% will go sideways, but they're hoping for the unicorn, right? They're hoping for the one, you know, Airbnb or Lyft or Uber or uh, Apple, whatever it is that, that powers the portfolio. And, and to be honest, you're going to have to be lucky to get that. And this is the problem with venture capital investing. But another way to think of it is that if you bought a lot of these options and you bought them early, you bought them for a low price and when there was the most uncertainty, but you buy, let's say, 300 options, three, you buy the stock of 300 new companies and you mix it up according to geography, strategy and industry and so forth, you mix that up, you would have options on a lot of different futures playing out. Right. So if there's an, so if there's let's see, it's just so you could buy it right now, there w might be a recession. Well, if there's a recession, you know, 20 percent of those companies might just have the answer to the recession for many companies. The thing that helps save them money or when they hunker down and it's all about saving, saving costs, 20 percent of those companies might have that solution and might grow tremendously. Uh, a great example is uh, Overstock. Overstock couldn't get any money from any venture capitalist. And Patrick Byrne just happened to be at the right place at the right time when the big recession hit. He cleaned up by, by liquidating assets for companies. That's what they needed. And his stock did really well. So in another macro scenario, there might be continued boom. There might be a soft landing. All of these things, if you have a diversified portfolio of startup stock, which is options, have a chance to be the solution to whatever problem comes up in the macro environment over time. So we don't necessarily have to predict the future. We can just say, well, we believe that 20% of the companies in this portfolio are going to have the solution to whatever comes. And the other 80%, we expect to go down. That's in the model. 
what powers it is the convexity, convexity that comes from the fact that the stock option, the stock of small companies is effectively an infinitely long-term option. Yes, you get diluted, but you can model this, you can put it into a spreadsheet, and you can come up with a pretty good rationality for buying a whole bunch of very different stocks. Now, you're going to want to apply option theory to that. You're going to want to use something like a Black-Scholes model because this is a very inefficient market where things get priced by angels who, don't, who aren't very sophisticated and they don't use much of a pricing model. So you'd want to have pricing rules that give you a, you know, uh, a yes or no whether you want to buy these things or not according to your model so that you don't, you know, you don't use human judgment, you don't get swayed by, by your passions for the particular startups or their pitch, or how tall they are, or how convincing they are, but you just want to build a portfolio that, that's got the convexity you want to give you the built-in protection you need. And it turns out you can do that. I've written an essay on this. It's at globalbetaventures.com. And just to show you now to transition from, that's this is what we call an anti-fragile approach, even, and one of the things we look at in an anti-fragile approach Approach, approach is volatility. Uh, Nassim Taleb says, look, what's the definition of anti-fragile? Well, if something is fragile, it means if you're going to send it in a box to somebody, you're going to write, you know, fragile, do not jostle, do not bump, do not drop, right? But if something is anti-fragile and you want to send it to somebody, you, you'd write anti-fragile on it, please agitate, drop, do your worst to it because that's the conditions that it thrives under. And that's true with actually a lot of biological systems. It's like your immune system, your, your bones, uh, and many others. And so to build an, a barbell portfolio, we take 80% cash and cash equivalents over here, um, not equal weight, but the majority of the money in fairly stable assets, real assets and stable investments over here. And then the rest you would do, you would place as options. And what's in the middle? Well, nothing. Most portfolios are full of bonds and stocks. And uh, a barbell portfolio doesn't have any of those things because they all correlate when everything goes south, when there's a recession or prices drop. So you just have two ends. On one end is very stable investments, and the other end is your portfolio of options that is designed to outperform. And you can build a sophisticated option program that continues to renew options, just buying options in the market. Uh, this is what some hedge funds do. Or you could buy, say, 300, 400, 500 startup stocks and just sit on that and watch it play out as the macro environment unfolds to benefit some companies and not others. And you're going to find that this is not a bad blended return um, because the optionality is not only going to pay off well on the, uh, uh, on the convexity side, um, but, but if you have enough of them, if you have enough startups in your portfolio, and I'm talking maybe four or five, 600 startups, then you might very well have very little downside risk. Now, this is counterintuitive. You might think, well, no, 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 they could all go away. You're kidding? This is just tremendously risky investments. But a massively diverse portfolio of high risk, high return investments is less risky than you think because of the anti-fragile convexity that will pay off in almost any macro environment. So you could model it and find out that preservation of capital in that situation is actually very good. That your chances of going below a 1x return are very, very low. And in fact, if you bought the S&P, chances of going negative in any particular period are, are reasonably high. And if you lever up the S&P, you might have a chance to get the same kind of returns, but you might have a chance to lose quite a bit in a recession. Whereas an anti-fragile portfolio of startup stock, which is really options, could give you 
a very low chance of loss of your capital, but a very high chance of return in the five, six, seven, eight X area. Now, the fewer in that portfolio, the bigger chance that you might get the next Uber or the next Google or Facebook, you know, Microsoft, that's possible. And then you get the big payoff, but you might also have a chance of losing your money, but you could dial it in, adding more stocks to that. And you'd find that you have very low chance of losing any money at all. I know it sounds crazy, but this is in your model. I mean, it, it, can it happen? Yes, of course. There are always conditions that are exactly the, the perfect storm for hurting any portfolio. Uh, it turns out that those same conditions will probably hurt the rest of the portfolio more, uh, like the real estate, for example, would probably be hurt even more. But so you could dial it in so that there's very little chance of loss of capital and a reasonable expectation of a, say, a three to eight X. It might, might be centered on about a five X type return expectation. And then it's going to have variance. It depends on how things play out. And of course, you know, we don't, we can't predict. It could even be better if there is a unicorn in that portfolio. That's going to give you a little more, although not much, because you're designing the unicorns out. You're just taking like, like one three hundredth of your portfolio is any particular company. So if one of those goes to the moon, it's really not going to move your needle that much. That's, that's actually by design because then you, you can't get hurt either. You could design a portfolio where you have 90% confidence that your return will be in the three to six X range and give you the leverage you need to justify building this set of options right here that could power a barbell portfolio. Now, is this possible? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Uh, do venture capital firms do it? Generally, no. Uh, they, they are buying deals that are too expensive and shooting for unicorns. They want skewness. The cool thing about this approach, and this is, again, counterintuitive, that this approach doesn't rely on the, ske on the skewness of returns. It relies instead on the normal distribution, the law of large numbers, so we think that, you know, I always say that venture capitalists are, are betting on the law of small numbers. They think that a small number of companies will return the result of a large number, but that's just not true. Many, many venture capital funds do not do well. They, they often have about a one, the average, I think, in the, in the industry for a normal venture capital, Series A, Series B, is about 1.9x. So many VCs tell the story about their fantastic returns, but but maybe what really happened is they got particularly lucky that time. And if they got lucky a few funds in a row, well, that's, that's going to happen. So some, some funds are going to have that story. That doesn't mean that it's all skill. But if you have the law of large numbers really working for you, and that is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of long-term, infinitely long options, you might actually be able to say you have a normal distribution to your returns and chances of zero and chances of something, you know, just like 15 or 20 X are both vanishingly small, but the chances in the middle of a 90% chance to have, you know, a th three to eight X return are actually possible. If you want to talk to me about that, I'll be happy to talk to you. Just contact me and let's set up a time for a conversation.